first question is, did Jesus sit or stand when he spoke? <laughs> the answer, like in many other questions, is both. <laughs> but when he sat, <clears throat> it was more like a family gathering. And uh, sometimes it's good to recognize that we are a family. When you stand, it's more formal. <clears throat> okay, we have two sessions and I'll try and there are a whole lot of questions here and I'll try and answer them. <clears throat> there are questions related to life which are far more important than questions which are theoretical. <clears throat> so, most of these are related to life, so I'm very thankful. You know, the type of questions a group asks is a pretty good indication of their spiritual hunger. So, you're a bunch of hungry people. I'm very thankful to see that. <clears throat> okay, the first question is, how do you know God is speaking to you? <clears throat> and uh, another question relates to that, how can you talk with God? See, prayer is like a phone call. For most Christians, prayer is not like a phone call. Uh, for many Christians, prayer is like, like I'm doing right now. Talking to God, and you guys just sit quiet and listen. That's how many people pray. It's like speaking on a microphone to God and telling Him everything, and He's just got to listen. <clears throat> I have never believed in that type of prayer. I'm very thankful that I did not follow the books I read on prayer. The only book I read on prayer was the Bible. And that taught me that uh, blessed is the man who hears me. And man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God's mouth. You know that verse. Not every word that comes out of my mouth to God, but that comes out of God's mouth to me. So when I realized that's the way I'm going to live, <clears throat> I said, my prayer is going to be like a phone call, which has got a earpiece and a mouthpiece, where I speak and I listen. <clears throat> and if you are speaking to someone more godly than you, you will definitely listen more then you speak. I hope so. So if you believe that God is more spiritual than you are, <laughs> that shouldn't be difficult to believe. You should be listening more than speaking. <clears throat> so ask yourself in your prayer life, or whatever you call it, do you speak more or do you listen? <clears throat> and then you'll understand why your Christian life is so shallow. <clears throat> You're so arrogant that you treat God like some junior whom you keep telling things to <clears throat> and you don't listen. <clears throat> There's nothing I can tell God about myself which he doesn't already know. But there are a lot of things that God can tell me which I don't know. So if I have a hunger to listen, then I will learn how to talk with God and how to know he's speaking to me. <clears throat> and one of the illustrations I use is this. If there are ten women speaking on the other side of the road and one of them is your mother on the other side of the wall, how is it you can recognize her voice but I can't? There's only one answer to that. You've heard her so often that in the midst of ten other voices you can pick out your mother's voice. So the way to recognize God's voice out of the many voices that we hear in our heart is by hearing it often. If you don't have the habit of listening to God often, you will not be able to recognize His voice. So then the question comes, how shall I start? I'll tell you. Here is a book where you can be absolutely sure every word is the word of God. Read it. Obey it. And I guarantee you will learn to recognize God's voice. First of all, in the book, as you obey, 
and then in situations which are not in the book. Like for example, can I watch this TV program? You'll get an answer immediately. Uh, can I take this job? Should I marry this person or that person? Some things may take a little longer to get an answer, but you will get it. But if God sees that you're very eager to hear, and you prove that eagerness by first of all hearing what is written in his book, I guarantee from 50 years of my own experience that you'll be able to hear him accurately. One of the areas where I need to hear very accurately in the last more than 30 years is, Lord, I get a hundred invitations. Where do you want me to go? They all appear to be very genuine, <clears throat> sincere. <clears throat> but I know one thing that I can't be a blessing wherever I go. I can be a blessing only where God sends me. <clears throat> Some people have got this wrong idea that Brother Zach will of course be a blessing wherever he goes. Wrong. I can be a blessing only where God sends me. I can be a bit of a nuisance if I go where God doesn't send me. And I can, and I go around trying to preach on my own with some conceited idea that of course I can be a blessing everywhere. It's, I don't have that conceited idea. So I seek God. I've done that for many years. I say, Lord, don't let me go and waste time somewhere. And as I've tried to, I've tried to obey the Bible so much that one of my prayers nowadays is, Lord, before I leave this earth, I'm nearly 75 now, before I leave this earth, I want to have finished obeying every commandment that you have given to Christians in the New Testament. So I encourage all of you to start right now with that prayer. And the second thing I've asked the Lord for is, Lord, help me before I leave this earth to claim every promise that you have given for Christians, not promises given to Israel, but for Christians in the Bible, I want to claim all of them. All of them. If you get 10 checks in the mail, how many of them do you deposit in the bank? Nine? Is 90% good enough? When it comes to money, we are so careful. What about the promises of God? They are like checks. How many of them do you want to claim? I want to claim all of them before I leave this earth. So when you have that attitude, you will be able to discern the voice of God because God sees you're serious about His commandments and His promises and then you will hear uh, God speaking to you and as you speak to Him He can hear you. You can even speak in your thoughts. That's the wonderful thing about talking to God. You don't have to open your mouth. Uh, when you speak in your thoughts the devil can't hear you because the devil cannot hear your thoughts. 1 Corinthians 2 says who can understand, hear a, understand a man's thoughts except the man himself? God can hear my thoughts, but the devil can't. So, you can speak or you can th have a thought. The wonderful thing about prayer is, even if you have a burden in your heart, which you haven't expressed in prayer, that is a prayer. God sees that and He will answer it, even though you haven't verbally expressed, expressed it. God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. So that's what I would encourage all of you to do. A very good habit to develop. Talk and listen. Talk and listen. And listen more than you talk. Because he already knows your needs. Okay. Uh, what is fellowship? Some examples. How to fellowship with people of different faiths. Well, you can't really fellowship with people of different faiths. By that I mean non-Christians. You can have friendship with them. Friendship is different from fellowship. We must be friends with all human beings. I've all, I made it my policy that I'll only have one enemy and that's the devil. And I'll never f consider any human being my enemy even if he considers me his enemy. Uh, I, from my side, nobody is my enemy. Uh, I love them. When it says love your enemies, it's people who treat you as enemies. So, <clears throat> Uh, but we can have friendship with everybody. But fellowship is true Christian fellowship. As we saw in 1 John 1, comes through God. 
That is true fellowship. You know, when we speak about the church as the body of Christ, how do these two hands have fellowship? You know, there are so many things I can do with two hands and people who are pianists can do a lot more things with ten fingers. And you see a really good pianist, how the fingers move so perfectly, with split second timing and even the foot touching the pedal, pedals. It's so fast. And it's, how do these two hands work together so well? It's not because they're always hanging around with each other, you know, holding each other. That's not the reason. In fact, they hang around with each other very rarely. <laughs> uh, sometimes we think if we hang around with somebody long enough, we'll have fellowship. It's not true. Because how often in a, in a day do you hold your hands together? Yet they work perfectly because of one reason. Both of these, including all the fingers, are connected to the head. And their working together is dependent on their connection to the head. Now, if one of them loses its connection to the head, like paralysis, right. then it won't be able to play the piano. Fellowship is gone. Fellowship is gone because the fellowship with the head is gone. That's why John says in 1 John, our fellowship is with God first of all, and then with each other. So it comes through the Lord. That's why I always say the best way to love your wife is to love Jesus first and more than your wife. Then you will be faithful to her and love her much better than if you love her horizontally. Through Christ you'll be faithful to her, devoted to her, and be sacrifice, sacrificial everything. Same way with one another. So fellowship is dependent on your fellowship with God. Now I've proved this in different situations where, you know, I meet someone say after one year. But during that one year, I've been walking in fellowship with God and he's been walking in fellowship with God. And when, when we meet together, it's almost as though we were meeting each other the whole year. It's just as good as having been together the whole year because we've been walking individually in fellowship with God. So that is the way to build fellowship which builds the body of Christ. Okay. Uh, were you blessed and helped to grow by any particular authors or books in your early Christian days outside of the Bible, do you recommend any? It's very difficult to say because um, I don't remember all the authors I read in those days. But as a principle I would say, I never read a, a Bible commentary which spoke to my head. Most Bible commentaries like Bible schools are geared to give you information. It's intellectual. And as soon as I saw that in the first few, page, few pages, I would put it away. I said, I don't want that. There are very few commentaries that speak to your heart. So I think I found one or two in those days and I read them because I didn't know in the beginning how to study the Bible. And they were a help to me. But I think those are all authors which I don't think their books are even available nowadays. I'm talking about when I started studying the Bible 55 years ago. So, but the thing is now we have so many more facilities with the internet that, um, for example, if you want to study, I've encouraged people in my own church. I said, if you go to our church website, cfcindia.com, we have a verse-by-verse verse study of the entire New Testament from Genesis, uh, Matthew chapter 1 all the way to the last verse in Revelation. Most of them in about 12-minute segments. And I said, all you've got to do is wake up 15 minutes early or go to bed 15 minutes late, later than normal. You can become quite a good Bible scholar in about two or three years because you have so many hours of Bible study that will go through right through. And if you have more time, you can listen to more. But if you make it a discipline saying, well, I'm going to spend at least 15 minutes a day going verse by verse through the New Testament, you'll be amazed at how much you can know in a couple of years. Whereas you look back over the past two years, you may have had that time, but you just wasted it. But a little bit of time each day can make a lot of difference. And we also have Bible studies on Genesis, Proverbs, and different books of the Old Testament, not all of them, the important ones. And we also have on that website an overview of the whole Bible called 70 Hours Through the Bible, every book from Genesis to Revelation. 
let me recommend that you begin by listening to some of that and see if it helps you. Because, you know, I, when my younger days, I longed to find Bible teaching that is applied to practical daily life. And that was very difficult to find. A lot of the teaching was more academic. It's okay. That's fine. Yeah, a, l a lot of the teaching was academic and uh, the Bible study, and I didn't want that. So here you'll find Bible teaching is related to practical life, just like I preach. So you try that. I, uh, it's very difficult to recommend certain authors. Okay, another question is, how do you get to know God as your father? The Bible says the Holy Spirit, it's in Romans 8, 16, I think, which says, cries out within us, Daddy. You know, that's the actual translation of that word. In, in your Bible, you'll read Abba. But Abba is not an English word. Abba is a Hebrew word. And if you translate that Hebrew word, the correct translation for Abba is not Father, it is Daddy. The spirit from within us cries out, Daddy. You see, that's an intimate word that a little child calls his father, Dad. And it's wonderful to be able to look up to heaven and call Almighty God, Dad. And it's the Holy Spirit, when He comes into your heart, makes you do that. You know, when you receive Christ into your heart, the Spirit of God comes in. You may not be filled with the Holy Spirit. That depends on how earnestly you have sought God. Some people are filled with the Spirit as soon as they are born again. Some people a little later. But and some people are filled and then they're not filled a little later. The fullness of the Spirit is something continuous. You must be filled with the Spirit all the time. You may have a crisis experience like some people have had, I've had. But the important thing is not the crisis, it's the daily infilling of the Holy Spirit. But when Christ comes in, it's the Spirit of Christ that comes to dwell in you when you ask Jesus to come into your heart. And He cries out, Abba, Father. I never tell a person when he's received Christ, okay, now you're a child of God. Because that privilege is given to the Holy Spirit. He's the one who has to assure you you're a child of God. Because he only knows whether you prayed in sincerity. I don't know. But if you have prayed in sincerity and turned from your sin and asked Jesus to come and be Lord of your life, you can be absolutely sure the Holy Spirit will give you that assurance from God's Word and make you call God Daddy. That's how we begin. And then as we walk with him, you know, just like your own father. For example, if your father is living in some distant country and just sends you occasional letters and gifts, you'll never get to know him. But if he's living in the same house, even then you don't get to know him unless you spend time together. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, many fathers do not spend time with their children. It's very, very sad. And a distance comes between father and children which is a very sad distance, comes between mother and children. So, as you spend more time talking to your dad, you get close to them, just like an earthly relationship. So, if you take time to talk to God and listen to him every day, you get to know him better. How can a man overcome lusting with other women and justifying it, and justifying it, by saying God created us with that nature? Well, God did not create us with that nature. God created us pure. I mean, God created Adam innocent. He wasn't holy. God, just by the way, God can never create anyone holy. To create a person holy, he would have to make a robot. You need to understand this. That means he automatically obeys God in everything. That would be like the planets. The planets have obeyed God for thousands of years without one second disobedience. But they cannot become sinners. The planets can't be sinners and the planets can't be children of God because you need freedom of choice to become a child of God or a sinner. And you also need conscience. So when God created Adam, he could not create him holy. Adam had to cho choose to become holy. He created him with the freedom of choice and he went into the Garden of Eden and with the opportunity to become holy, he became a sinner. So, the same choice God gives us today. He cannot make you holy unless you choose. 
That's why he gives us the opportunity in times of temptation to choose. So it's not natural to lust after women. It's natural to be, for a man to be attracted to a woman. That is created by God, but the purpose of that is marriage. So in marriage, that purpose is fulfilled. But when you go outside of marriage and begin to be interested in other women who are not your wife, that is going outside the boundary God has drawn for you. That's something like God's given you a certain amount of income and you're not satisfied with that, so you go and steal somebody else's money. And you can't say, well, God put a desire in me for money, so I went and stole. <laughs> not at all. It's just like that <laughs> to say, God's put a desire in me for sex, so I lust after that woman. No, that desire for sex is to be fulfilled with your own wife. And that's why it says to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Okay. Another question is how to discern one's good intentions from doing God's will. Okay, the thing is, to do good is always a good thing. There are a lot of non-Christians who do good, Hindus and Muslims do a lot of good things. And, uh, but I can have a good intention and yet it may not be the will of God for my life because there is a proverb in English or a saying that the good is the enemy of the best. I don't know whether you've heard that. There's bad, good, best. Good is better than bad, but best is better than good. And so you can do the good and miss the best. Or like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, I think it's verse 10 or 12, that all things are lawful for me, but all things are not profitable. So if you choose only the lawful things in your life, uh, you may not be a sinner, but you may not be a very mature Christian. But out of the ten lawful things you can do, you choose the two or three that are really profitable and spend your time doing that, you'll become a mature spiritual Christian. It's true in every sphere of life that if you have priorities for that which is really good, then you can um, live a more profitable life than if you just do everything that's supposed to be good, if you, you can miss the best. So to discern God's will, I must first of all again read the Bible. Everything starts with knowing uh, reading the Bible, like I read this, said this morning, um, God's ways are not my ways. And there may be something which I choose which may be good and God may have something better than that for me. And so if I just do what's good, I can miss what is best because I have a limited amount of time. Like, you know, I said, maybe you can do good in ten different places to people. But maybe God wants you to go to just one place. That's the place where you can accomplish the maximum good for his kingdom. So that is God's will for you. So there, that is why we should seek God's will in every department of our life. Okay. You say we should not be imitators of God but real authentic Christians. What about Ephesians 5 one where it says be imitators of God could you clarify Ephesians 5 1 is speaking about one particular area whenever you read a verse always read the context it's a very bad habit that many Christians have of taking one verse and you can sometimes not understand it properly if you don't see the context so the context is uh, sometimes you've got to ignore chapter divisions because chapter divisions and verses were added later on by man to make it easy for us to refer to the Bible. They were not, when Paul wrote Ephesians, it was just one long letter. There were no chapters or paragraphs or verses. The Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, listen carefully, just as God in Christ has forgiven you and in that area be an imitator of God as good children. So you understand it's referring to imitate God in the sense that you forgive others the way God forgave you. That doesn't conflict with what I said 
of partaking of his nature. You know, I can externally imitate the actions of Jesus and it may not be partaking of his nature. There are a lot of people who try to do the good things that Jesus did on the outside who are not even born again, who haven't partaken of God's nature. That comes through the Holy Spirit. So that's what I was saying. Okay. Now, if you don't, if you're not satisfied with some of these answers, you can always go to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I was not satisfied with what Brother Zach said. Please explain it to me a little more clearly. And if there is a clearer answer, he'll give it to you. Okay. I have taken some decisions and made some commitments before becoming a Christian and born again. And these commitments and decisions may not be pleasing to God. How do I go about those things and commitments? See, we don't have to keep commitments that violate God's word. But if it is a commitment that does not violate God's word, you should try your best to keep it. But if when you were, before you were a Christian, you joined the Freemasons or something and took some vows or some secret society which is contrary to God's will or took some vow which was foolish. I'll give you an example. There was a non-Christian villager in India who he came to Christ and he was a milkman. He was a poor milkman and he like all milkmen in India do, you know, they go house to house selling milk. They always add water in the milk before selling it. You know, I, I hope you realize you can make more profit that way. So, this is how every milkman does it. So this guy was also doing it and he became a Christian. And when he became a Christian, he realized, hey, I can't do that anymore. And he repented of having added water in the milk. And he said, well, I'll try an honest, honest living. I may not be able to compete with these crooks, but I just want to trust that God will bless me. But because of his, he's a non-Christian background, you know, you don't realize as Christians how non-Christians think that even if Christ died for my sins, I still have to do something to afflict myself uh, before I can really be sure I'm forgiven. I can't get it so cheap. It can't be free. It can't be absolutely free. It's imp you know, non-Christian religions will never tell you that forgiveness is absolutely free. It's unbelievable. You have to do something, burn some candles or make some prayers or go to some sacrifice or some pilgrimage or something. So uh, he felt, yeah, Christ has died for me. That's my sins are forgiven, but I have to show my repentance in some way. So I will show my repentance by killing my cow. So I took a, he took a vow before God, Lord, because of what I did wrong, I'll kill my cow. And then as he thought about it later, he realized, hey, I've got only one cow. How will I uh, survive <laughs> if I kill it? But he had already taken a vow. Now, fortunately, within a few days after that, we had a conference in that part of India. And he came and met me. And I said, you don't have to do anything. Christ paid it all. He's forgiven us completely. He, you don't have to add anything to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So he was very relieved to hear that, but he said, what about this vow? You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, if you make a vow to God, you better keep it. Don't go back on your vow. I said, God is a father. And if some three-year-old child comes to a father and says, I'm fed up of living in this house, I'm leaving tomorrow. And the father is not going to hold him to his word the next day and say, <laughs> you said you're leaving today, leave. <laughs> The father knows this is a stupid three-year-old saying stupid things. <laughs> so I said, God knows you were a stupid young child who said a few stupid things. <laughs> he ignores it. He's not going to hold you to that stupid vow you made. Forget it. He's a loving father. I think as a result of that, he got such a revelation of the goodness of God as a father, just like an earthly father. You know, this is a concept that non-Christians just do not have. And I'm sorry to say many Christians don't have. The extent of the love of God as a father. So if you made some commitments, you don't have to keep them if they violate God's law. If you've taken some decisions which are contrary to God's will, you don't have to keep it. 
if you committed yourself to marry a girl who is not born again or a boy who is not born again, now you're a child of God. You have to tell them, I'm sorry, another love has come into my life. It's not a human being, it's Jesus Christ. And uh, he's first in my life and I cannot marry a person who is not committed to Christ because we are going in different directions. Okay. Yeah, this is a question already answered. What are the concrete signs that I am baptized in the Holy Spirit? First of all, this word baptism is such a religious word that most of us don't understand it. It's very unfortunate that some words in the New Testament were never translated. If they were translated, we would have a better understanding. But they were transliterated, which means they took the same Greek or Hebrew word and put it into the uh, Bible. For example, like I just told you, Abba. Abba means dad. I'm so happy that I know that. I mean, if I say Abba, it doesn't mean that much to me because I'm not, I don't speak Hebrew. But when I say dad, that means something to me because I speak English. For example, Amen. Most Christians don't know what Amen means. Many of them just mean it's time to open my eyes, the prayer is over. <laughs> but the meaning is, it will be so. That's the Hebrew meaning of Amen. So now when you say Amen to a prayer, it will be more meaningful. It's like, try saying this next time somebody finishes his prayer. Don't say Amen. Somebody finishes his prayer and you say, it will be so. Hey. That means you're affirming what that person said. It's an affirmation of faith. What's use praying to God if you don't believe it's going to happen? You pray for something, you must say, yes, it'll be so. Otherwise, you don't have faith. So, amen is an expression of faith, which has become such a ritual statement. <clears throat> Take another word, hallelujah. It's just a Hebrew word which means praise the Lord. The last Yah is a short for Yehovah. And they used to say praise the Lord. But it's really, again, Hebrew. That's why in the entire New Testament epistles, you won't find it even once. These are all habits that Christians have acquired through the years. The New Testament Christians would just say praise the Lord. They didn't speak Hebrew. They spoke some other language. And you speak English, you say praise the Lord. He, hallelujah comes only four times in the New Testament and that's in the book of Revelation chapter 19 where it says, thank God Babylon is destroyed. False Christianity is destroyed. That's the place where hallelujah comes. So uh, another example where I'm almost certain that most of you don't have used the word frequently but you don't have a clue what it means. is the word Hosanna. It's there in some of our songs. And I think most of you, if I were to ask you to write down the meaning of Hosanna, you'd think it means some expression of praise to God. It is not. It's a Hebrew word which means save us right now. It's a good prayer to pray. Lord, save me from sin right now. But when you sing Hosanna in the songs which contain Hosanna, is that what you're thinking of? No. Develop the habit of um, thinking, what am I saying to God here? Think of every word that you sing. What does it mean? You know, f the other day I was uh, singing that well-known song, Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. You know that? Um, well, one line in it says, uh, riches eternal and blessing supernal. And I had sung it for so long without understanding what the word supernal means. Do you know what supernal means? S-U-P-E-R-N-A-L? I, I was amazed. Hey, how is that? I sing it for so often and I don't even know what the meaning of that word is. So I decided to look it up and I found it meant heavenly. It's another word for heavenly. So... Uh, I'm just saying that so often we say things, you'd never go and speak to a friend or a, your father using a word you don't even know the meaning of. And if your dad asks you, what do you mean by that? I say, I don't know, there's some word I learned somewhere. <laughs> do you speak to God like that? And that's just a point I wanted to clarify. So baptism 
is a word which means immersion. So translate it as immersion and you understand it better. Water baptism is immersion in water when we are baptized. Immersion in the Holy Spirit, that is standing under the waterfall. The Holy Spirit's picture like a river of God flowing mightier than the Niagara falling from heaven and I stand underneath and I'm immersed in the Holy Spirit which means every part of my being is immersed with the Holy Spirit and I must remain under that waterfall to be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. And the evidence that Jesus gave is Acts 1 verse 8 which is power. Power to be a witness. Acts 1 8 you shall receive the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And earlier on in verse 5 he said you should be baptized or immersed in the Holy Spirit. And when that was fulfilled, Acts 2, 4, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit, Acts 1, 5. When it was fulfilled, it's written as Acts 2, 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's the same thing. Immersed in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, same thing. And how do you know you shall receive power to be my witness. Being a witness is more than bearing witness. Bearing is only with words. Being is by my life and my words. So that is the mark of being filled with the Holy Spirit or immersed in the Holy Spirit. That I have power to be a witness by my life. That means strength to overcome the unchristlike traits and habits in my life. And power to be a bold witness for Christ, not necessarily to be a teacher of God's word like me. If you're called to be a teacher like me, he'll equip you to be a teacher. I'm absolutely convinced that I don't have the ability to be a teacher, but God anointed me and gave me that supernatural gift to be able to teach God's word. And if that's your calling, he'll give it to you. But your calling may not be that. You may be just called to be a spirit-filled mother of children. Well, then God will give you the power to be that. So it's equipped by God to be the type of witness according to your calling in the body of Christ. So when you have power for that and if you feel a lack of it, how did you come to Jesus for forgiveness of sins? Because you felt guilty. Lord, I feel a lack of forgiveness. You came to Jesus and he forgave you. How do you know? You say, well, I read it in God's word that if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us. And you got the witness of the Holy Spirit. So it is the double witness of God's word and the Holy Spirit that assured you of the forgiveness of sins. Apply the same rule to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Luke 11 verse 13 says, If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, Luke 11 13, how much more your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit, not to everybody, but to those who ask Him. If you ask Him, and you keep asking him, like in the earlier part of that chapter, the man who went to his neighbor's house and knocked till he got. That's the point of that parable. Knock until you get. Your father will give you more readily than you give food to your children. And there you got the promise of God's word. Then ask the Holy Spirit to give you a witness in your spirit that he has filled you. You open every part of your life to Christ and say, Lord, to the best of my knowledge, I give every area of my life to you. I want you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not some postgraduate degree. It's basic what we need right at the beginning of our Christian life. So ask God to fill you. You don't have to be mature. You can be filled with the Spirit the day you're born again if you surrender every area of your life. And it's like, you know, if I were to open those curtains up on top, the sunlight would come in immediately. You don't have to even invite the sunlight in. It's not coming in right now because it's closed. It's like that in our heart, you know, if I keep something closed, and I say, oh Lord, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me. He can't. I've locked the door on the inside. But allow the Holy Spirit to come into every area of your life. Say, Lord, I want you to control every area of my life. You know, what TV programs I watch, what books I read, where I go, what I do. Every area, you have complete control. My ambitions for the future, everything. And if you open yourself like that, you can be absolutely sure, like the sunlight comes in, the Spirit of God will fill you. 
Um, how important f or for good is it for God for us to find a soulmate? It doesn't seem to be much about it in the scriptures or the deep dynamic partnership. See, there are, it was God who found a partner for Adam. I hope you know that. Adam didn't go running around Eden looking for a wife and he didn't go pestering God saying, give me a wife. God knew Adam's need and said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helpmate for him. There's one example. Then you have another example of Abraham sending his servant looking for a partner for his son Isaac. That was an what we call an arranged marriage. Some people are against arranged marriages. But here you see arranged marriage, which is in the will of God. Rebecca was God's will for Isaac. But it's not through dating that they found each other. They found each other through an arrangement where the father looked for a partner for his son. And God sovereignly led the right girl to Isaac. And then you have a case of two finding each other, also in the Bible, that is Ruth and Boaz. They, they were not, that was not arranged by the parents, they just found each other. So all these, you know, indicate that God is not the prisoner of any particular culture. And he's interested in finding, Boaz was the right person for Ruth. So God is interested in this very important decision of marriage for your life, and if you believe, he can guide you. And then, of course, there are a lot of principles concerning marriage in Scripture, too. I asked God for healing, and it comes. I asked God for a job, and it came in abundance. I asked for a car, and it came better than I thought. You're a lucky guy. At least. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> at least in earthly things. But when I ask for a wife, he doesn't answer. Why? <laughs> You're not as lucky as I thought. <laughs> The other things could all be coincidences <laughs> because there are a lot of people in the world who get good jobs, good cars, and even healing in hospitals. You go and ask doctors, non-Christians get healed as well. I'm not saying God is not in all these things, but remember God is a loving Father and you can't say that He doesn't care. So don't think God is not interested in the most. It's much more important for you to get a good wife than a good car. I hope you believe that. <laughs> Definitely. A good wife will do you a lot more good than a good car any day. So, but you must believe that God is interested in you. If you come to him with unbelief, you won't get it. So let me give you a definition, my definition, which I've worked out through many years. Uh, I can't give you an exact verse for that in the Bible, but it's based on this. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts, like it says in Matthew 7:11, to those who ask him. So based on that verse, my definition of faith is this. God is more eager to give me what he has promised than I am eager to get it. Here's the definition of unbelief. I am more eager to get what God has promised then God is eager to give it to me. Now tell me, what do you have? Unbelief or faith? Many of you will say you have unbelief. You think you are more eager to be filled with the Holy Spirit than God is to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Well, no wonder you're never filled with the Holy Spirit because it's unbelief. Unbelief is, I am more eager. God doesn't seem to be so eager. Well, you keep that attitude, you'll never be filled with the Spirit. Change it to faith. God is more eager than I am to be filled with His Holy Spirit. God is more eager than I am that I should have the partner of His choice. But when He brings you the partner of His choice, don't say, oh Lord, she's not good looking enough for me. <laughs> Maybe he sees that attitude in you, then say, God says, I've given up on you. Go and find whom you like. <laughs> so, if you're looking for, I'm not saying you shouldn't look for a good looking wife, but look for someone who is spiritual. You know, Proverbs 11:22 says that beauty is only like the 
a golden ring. If the character of a woman is like a pig and she's got beauty like a golden ring, it's like a pig with a golden ring on its nose. And you fall so much in love with the golden ring that you marry the pig. That's, <laughs> you got to be careful. <laughs> but that's exactly what a lot of men do. Boy, what a pretty girl. What a lovely golden ring. I mean, let's forget that it's a pig. I'm going to marry it. This is Proverbs chapter 11, verse 22. This is not my idea. The illustration is given by God himself. So, uh, let me see if that reference is right. I think it is. I'm getting a bit old now. I don't always remember the right references. Yeah, it is. 11.22. Okay. So, trust God. He'll give it to you. I'm asking about uh, the tithe and offerings to God. I love your preaching that you don't give, just give 10% to God. You give, he, he must have 100% of my life. That's right to Jesus. But how much of my money, of my income, should I give to the church? God bless you. The answer is as much as you can give cheerfully. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 says, um, God loves a cheerful giver. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So you must not give grudgingly or reluctantly. That's the first condition, one condition of giving. Now a lot of covetous pastors tell you, you must pay 10%. They go back to the old covenant. But if you go back to the old covenant, that pastor must also tell you to sacrifice lambs and sheep and grain offerings and a whole lot of other oil offerings. Why don't they tell you that? Why only money? And the second thing that they don't tell you is in the Old Testament, tithe was never, never money. It was always grain or cattle. 10% of your grain which you got from your field, 10% of what you got from your flock, give it to the Levites because they're not supposed to own any property. Pastors say, we are Levites. I ask them one question, do you own property? Then you're not a Levite. Definitely not. The old Levites were not supposed to own property. So people go back to the old covenant when convenient, when particularly covetous pastors do that. But nowhere in the New Testament does it say pay your tithe. It says give cheerfully. That's one principle. And the other is 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, which says give as God, as you are prospered. That means according to your ability. If you got more, you can give more. If you got less, less. And if you don't have anything, you don't have to give anything. The other principle is what Jesus said in Matthew 6, don't let your left hand know what your right hand knows that gives, that means give secretly. So secretly, cheerfully, and as God has prospered you. These are some of the fundamental principles of giving. And there's no law as to how much you, you must give. It's entirely up to you. And you know, it's, the, but you should not give out of some pressure. It's very clear in 2 Corinthians, 9-7 that you must not give out of compulsion. That's the verse that a lot of pastors disobey. They compel people to give. And there's so many tricks that people adopt to get people to pay. So I would say, seek God. See how much you can afford. And, uh, you know, we have a website called uh, cfcindia.com and there's one section there if you go to about us and finances you'll see our financial principles it's the most unique that you'll find anywhere on the internet in all the billions of sites on the internet you'll never find one like this it says there if you're thinking of giving money to us first fulfill these five conditions number one you must be born again it's a great privilege to give to God, but only his children can give, nobody else. Secondly, God will not accept an offering in Matthew 5 if you have something unsettled with a brother who's got something against you. Jesus said, go and settle the matter with that person, then come and give your offering. Matthew 5 and verse 23, 24. The third thing, do you have a debt? If you have a debt, clear your debt first. I don't mean a house loan. A house loan is not a debt because you got a house for that money. That's not a loan. If you're taking a car loan, that's not a debt because you got a car. If it's insured, that covers it. 
But other loans, if you have a debt, the, Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and then give to God what is God's. Otherwise, you're giving God Caesar's money and he doesn't want it. So that's the third condition. And fourth condition is 1 Timothy 5.8. A man, a believer, will take care of his own family. If you don't have enough to take care of your own children, feed them, clothe them, educate them, God doesn't want your money. God is a rich billionaire, multi-billionaire father. And he doesn't want his children struggling and starving to give some money to him. And number five, don't give money to God because somebody pressurizes you or to ease your conscience and definitely not to get a reward back from him. So some people have told me, Brother Zach, with all these five conditions, does anybody ever give you any money for the God's work? <laughs> <laughs> you make it so difficult. <laughs> and we put this on top of our offering box in our church as well. So I say we are more interested in the spiritual welfare of people than in their money. That's our principle in our church. So the last 40 years, we have never taken an offering in our church. We keep an offering box there and say, if you fulfill these five conditions, put it in. And I'll tell you my testimony after 40 years. We have never had a lack. We have never had to take a bank loan to build our church buildings. And we built a number of church buildings across India. This is the principle in all the 50 churches that we have followed, that we have. Same principle. So, it just proves that you honor God, God will honor you. We have preached against tithing. I remember once I was preaching in a Pentecostal church and the pastor said, Brother Zach, everything you say is so good. Why do you preach so much against tithing? As it is, they give so little. After listening to you, they'll give nothing. I said, it's not true. <laughs> I said, look at our own church. I preached that for 40 years. And we have never had a lack. We have conferences where we give free food and... Um, even accommodation to people. For years, we've never had a lack because we said, Lord, we want to honor your principles of your word, and that's what we've done. And it's an amazing testimony in a poor country like India. Um, you're welcome to come and see. Okay, so give as God has prospered you and as you feel prompted in your spirit. Uh, Jesus said, when we accept him, we've got to hate our parents. So what's the role of parents and what if our parents are non-believers? You know, before you hate your parents, which is in Luke 14, 26, it says in Ephesians 6, you've got to honor your parents. The first commandment is not hate your parents. Remember that. When you're a little child, the first commandment, Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3 is honor your parents, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, there are a lot of, you know, grown-up teenagers and people in their 20s who say, I love that command which says, hate your parents. That's exactly what I feel like doing. <laughs> I say, you, are not, you guys are not, that's not meant for you. You've never honored your parents. So how in the world can you qualify to, you can't go to college before you pass school. And uh, so that's, so the first step is honor your parents. Honor, even if you're left, when you're at home, you also obey them. Once you're left home, you don't have to obey them, but you still have to honor them till the end of your life. That's a principle of God. I did it all my life, as long as my parents were alive. And hate is a relative statement. It's a strong word. Hate is the opposite of love, like darkness is the opposite of light. So when you compare scripture with scripture, in Luke 14 it says, hate your father and mother. In Matthew chapter 10, similar passage, Jesus said, if you love your father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. So that's the meaning of hatred. When you can't understand a scripture, go to another scripture which amplifies it and explains it. So what does that mean? It's like I said earlier. As soon as the sun comes up, the stars disappear. So your love for your parents must be like the light of the stars. It has a light, but it's absolutely nothing compared to the, your love for Jesus, which should be the light of the sun. That's the point. That means compared to your love for Jesus, your love for your parents is like a little star. It's not non-existent, but that's what he meant, to love him more than uh, your parents. Okay. How can I use my material wealth to become an evangelist and spread the word without material obligation to others. We had to be wise, you know, whenever we give money to, we should not give money to a poor, pers to a poor person 
and him know that I gave it. In our church, I say, if you want to give money to a poor person, um, give it, put it in the offering box with his name there so that he doesn't feel that you gave it and he feels under some obligation to you. Now, if you're giving it for the Lord's work, that's fine. Then you can give it to anybody personally as well or in the box. If God has given us much, then we can use it for the spread of the gospel by giving it where we are sure that that is going for the spread of the gospel. And you see a lot of people in America support orphanages and Bible schools in India and other countries, which I know because I live there, do not go to orphanages and Bible schools. They go to the line the pocket of the guy who is running the institution. And there's so much of corruption in this area. Orphanages and Bible schools are the biggest rackets in Christian work in India. I know because I live at the other end. So the Bible says you must not only be a wise, faithful steward, you must be a wise steward. So that's very important. Okay, we'll have a break now and continue after that. Let's just pray. Our Father in heaven, help us to be more gripped with these truths. We pray you'll guide us and understand these answers, the right answers to all these questions. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>